And now I'd like to introduce you uh, in my, my, my left side. It's a friend which I met uh, first time in Vienna in the plan of action uh, which have been uh, presented by Adam Alie. And many times Adam Alie, the Under Secretary of the United Nations, when he's uh, talking with others, he started in this way, brothers and sisters in humanity. Uh, you are a brother in humanity with us. We are not in the same uh, part of the same religion, but uh, you are defending the same rights of uh, the religion. Uh, Imam, Imam uh, Razavi from Scottish Apple uh, by Society, United Nations House from UK, it's uh, with, us, with, with us today, and you are welcome. You, you have the floor. Thank you so much for having invited me. Uh, short notice. Uh, I'm not going to repeat what's already been said, but what I'll do is I'll put forward a, a perspective which I think is rather important. Firstly, to introduce the scene. So, we're living in a world at the moment which is suffering from polarization. <coughs> when you look across, it's not just a problem for Europe, but it's something found both in the East and the West. The idea that there's rising fundamentalism, be it secular, be it religious. It's not something that's restricted to one religion, but go across the world, be it in Burma, in India today, Pakistan, in Europe. What you're seeing is that religion or religious fundamentalism and secular fundamentalism, both right and left wing, is something which is plaguing us. So we're seeing essentially a movement that's taking place of ideologies, which are going either to one extreme or the other extreme. Now bringing it more closely to Europe, I think there's two issues which are plaguing Europe today and has been for the last five, seven, ten years or so. One of them is the rise of the far right. And as I remember over many lectures over many years, your former president, Boris and Van Rompuy, said to me both in private that the biggest fear that we actually have more than religious fundamentalism is the right wing. It's the rise of the right. And that's something which I believe it's important to bear in mind. Statistically speaking, if you go to the UK, as part of the Shuri Review, which Theresa made commission as an advisor, Looking at the statistics, we have more cases of far-right proven than we have of religious fundamentalism. But nevertheless, the discussion here is not, and I'm not going to do a faith versus secularism, I believe that both of us can coexist. Both of us essentially have the same values, and those values are humanity. There's something that links 7 billion of us together, and that is on the basis of humanity. That humanity speaks louder than any faith, any ideology. We're united together, and therefore we have to coexist. So that's the one thing. The second thing is this. We're, we're going through this migration issue today. And this migration issue is the worst that we've had ever since World War II. If you look at Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, you're seeing millions of refugees, and Europe hasn't taken the bulk of it. But there seems to be using almost this migration to create xenophobia, bigotry, and something which is Islamophobia, and Islamophobia is rising. <coughs> Whereas other forms of bigotry and other forms of racism have been cast to one side. In the words of a colleague of mine, Islamophobia has passed the table test. And you find that today, politicians <coughs> and others blatantly use things without even realizing that it's actually racism. People make comments on faith without realizing that actually it's racism. So, we have these two things. The question is this, how do we move towards a solution? If you look at Europe today, and you've heard just now, the Judeo-Christian template that we have is based upon virtue. It's the very same thing that Aristotle preached before that. In fact, you go to the Middle East today, the Abrahamic faiths and even the Taramic faiths have one thing in common, and that is virtue ethics. The idea that we're united through virtue. You may see me in a different cloth, you may see me different, but remember one thing physical manifestations of a faith is dependent upon civilization and culture. For example, Islam. Islam is a combination of seven cultures that make one big civilization. You go to Bosnia today, you'll see a Bosnian Muslim, blonde hair, blue eyes, and a miniskirt walking down the street, and you think, she must be Christian. No, she's actually Muslim. And in the same way, you go to Indonesia, and you'll see a particular cloth, or the way that people dress, and you see the same manifestations in India, and otherwise, seven cultures came together to form this civilization. So I think one of the biggest problems that we have, first thing, is a lack of religious and cultural literacy. And if that was to come into play, what you would see is most of our problems would be solved. Today, 
beyond the UK, beyond Europe, beyond the United States, and so forth, is a lack of religious literacy. And the reason being is that we thought in the 20th century religion was dead. Unfortunately, they were wrong. 21st century has seen the rise of religiosity amongst people where Europe, they used to say back in the 80s and 90s, only 20% believe in God. Today you're seeing a rise of that's more than double. And the United States, 85%, maybe may not adhere to a religion where they believe in a God. So therefore, faith does play a huge component within our lives. And therefore, there needs to be a form of religious literacy, which is that. Why is that important? Because when you begin to understand the other, what happens is that, that naturally, those walls that we build fall. You begin to talk to people, you establish friendships. <coughs> Today, for example, in Scotland, we have some of the best relationships in the world, I'd say, in terms of people of faith. You can find Jews, Muslims, and Christians sitting together very easily, having a Shabbat meal together, or coming for an Eid or a Sunday. And I think that's very important. <laughs> Friendships that are developed on grassroots, but it starts off with religious literacy. So I think that's one thing. Remember, bearing in mind, we have perennial values, which are the same. The most important thing is when you come to understand culture, and when you understand culture, it's through language. So language plays a huge part, and you'll see this, that as generations upon generations come into Europe, what happens is that you integrate. Now, the big question is this, why has an Islam integrated? as it had did for 1400 years, wherever it went, Spain integrated, parts of North Africa integrated, integrated within India, subcontinent, Indonesia, and so forth. And the biggest issue at the moment that's stopping integration is the role of the media in many ways, is the fact that there's a lack of literacy within faiths, which has led to polarization. In the words of a colleague of mine, Rabbi Sachs, there's two things happen when a community feels polarized, and you're seeing that with the migration issue. When a community feels polarized, it either becomes very insular, and the next thing that happens is it becomes very defensive. So you touch it, it overreacts. To remove that requires us to open our arms up, to allow for the integration process to take place, which is not taking place. Now, just to clarify one thing, Islamophobia is not disagreeing with Islam, criticizing or condemning. You can criticize, you can condemn, you can disagree. But the problem is this, that when stereotypes lead to mistruths, intentional hatred that comes from it, or discrimination that leads to violence, that is something which is wrong. You can have freedom of speech, by all means criticize whichever faith you want to, but when that leads to discrimination and when that leads to violence, as you've heard, that becomes an issue, to give you some statistics. And you can understand why communities are in the way that they are today. 91% of all reporting of Islam in the media is negative. Four out of five articles in the media, for example, show Muslims as a threat, as a problem. Cardiff University commissioned that. Hate crime. The last month in London alone, up by 300%. In Europe, month by month, is unprecedented. We've never seen such hate crime against a religious denomination like this or a religious since World War II. The problem is it's under the radar. People don't see it. And that community that today gives taxes, contributes to society, is being marginalized. Yes? It's the fault, not just the fault of one person, it's the fault of all. The fact of the matter is this, we need solutions. So as I said, first thing is religious literacy. Second thing is authentic voices need to come forward. And that's very important. If you want to understand a faith, I'm not going to go to the average taxi driver to ask him what Christianity or Hinduism or Judaism talks about. I'll go to somebody who's a cleric. And in the same way, I think, when it comes to Islam, if we are to solve the issue, because it's the elephant in the room, let's be honest, we require authenticity. Authenticity means going back to the root, going back to people who can authentically provide. I think the third thing really is this, a form of reconciliation is required. And reconciliation really means conversation. An open dialogue needs to take place. You can't shy away from it. I know that Europe believes in laicite, but laicite is not working, my friends. It hasn't done for many, many decades. And I think it's exacerbating the problem. Go to Paris and see the slums very openly saying it, said it in public forums before as well. Look over here just in Brussels. You have some of the worst tensions. It's not found in London, it's found there. And Lysit hasn't contributed to it because we put it under the radar that faith has no place. No, faith has a place. It has a very big place. And in a, in a world that's becoming more religious, religiousized, so to speak, it needs efforts to go into play. There needs to be efforts to combat stereotypes. There needs to be some kind of monitoring that takes place. But I think more so, remember one thing, for reconciliation to take place, and I'm not very 
positive about the phase agreement with Marrakesh a month before that, or the Washington that took place I was there only a couple of weeks ago. I don't believe they're the solutions, and I can tell you why they're not the solutions. When two groups come together to reconcile, you require a third party. When that third party comes in, two parties must compromise. Eventually, the spring is going to come back again. Respring's again. What is the solution? In the way that I presented in Vienna, which was backed by the WCC as well, and Adam also backed this, put it in to a steering committee. I think the solution really covenantal. What do I mean by that? The United Nations and Europe are contractual. In times of difficulty, they break. But what is a covenant? Deeply rooted within faiths, whether it be Abrahamic covenants, Mosaic, Noah, or even within the Dharmic faiths. Covenants are a moral obligation between two groups. That means that I have a reconciliation process, you have a reconciliation process. I'm not compromising, you're not compromising. But there is a moral responsibility for people of faiths and no faiths as well. Moral responsibility, covenantal, which starts at when? When there's a conflict. And at that stage, no group would feel that they're being marginalized. And the mechanisms within that, and those mechanisms work, that when people, for example, in Northern Ireland, agreements that took place, the Good Friday Agreement, it was actually covenantal, that's why it's lasted. You know, the words of Mary MacLeese, they worked very hard to produce a moral responsibility which was there. And in the same way, you go back to covenants that took place within Europe, Protestants and Catholics, resolutions took place because it was a moral obligation. I feel that if there's a template which is created by faiths and non-faiths, which is based upon a covenantal responsibility, you may see some solutions. Otherwise, I believe that when it comes to peace and reconciliation, if sides have to compromise, eventually the spring is going to spring back and people are going to feel oppressed. So really my final statement is just this. We share common humanity. We share common values. If you think that European values are not adhered by the Muslim community, they are. It's based upon virtue ethics and we across the world do that. For that to come out requires authenticity, not demonization. You need to bring people onto the table and to start talking. And when that speech takes place, when those friendships develop, when there's social action plans in place, and I'll give you an example. For example, in Scotland, what we did was a blood drive, done it in the UK as well. When Nicola Sturgeon herself felt that it was a good idea, what it led to was this. We brought many Muslims who felt marginalized forward to give blood. 95% of donors were people who weren't actually Muslim. You know what happens with that? Those people who are radicalized, let's say, when they have to give blood, psychologically they're saving the lives of others through that highly impactful, but what happens, we we're not discussing theology here, we're bringing people practically to help, whether it's the migration crisis, whether there's other crises, bring people into that, people who you feel are marginalized, let them contribute to society. Because when that takes place, only then can those barriers come down, and only then can they feel that they're contributing. So, in conclusion, it's this. Again, as I said, religious literacy, authenticity in voice, social action plans, but more so remember, we're human beings. And human beings, as Bonnie said, require love. So I think that that's probably the most important thing. Let's start loving one another and you will see many solutions take place. Thank you very much.